But it, it set me up for later that year. I went out and I had a tremendous year and I won the long jump in the 100 meters. And I was just thinking one day about my idol, Jesse Owens, who was an idol I met when I was a kid. And I said, I wonder what it was like for him to win four gold medals. I wonder, I wonder if I could ever do that because I was a sprinter and I did the same events. I met him. And, of course, because I met him and I did the same events, I just figured I could do what he did. I was a young enough kid and brash enough to think that. So I went to my coach and I said, what do you think about me trying to do all four of those events in 84? This is 1981. And he says, well, I don't know. It's, it's going to be a tough thing. But if you want to do it, we have to plan it out now and start thinking about it right now and, and try to do it. So I said, well, well let's, let's just see how it is. And I'd, I'd really like to do that. Well, I started to talk to everybody and different people, and everyone said, there's absolutely no way. It can't be done. You'll get injured. You can't do it. You can't make the team. And so I heard three years of it just can't be done. But what we did is we set a plan, and it was a, it was a plan that each year I would add another event. So I was number one in the world in the 100 and long jump in, in 81. Then I added the 200 the next year. Then I added all three of them the following year. Then it was the Olympic year. And I had to focus 100% on what I had to do, the training focus outside of the track, no distractions, because I had to make sure that everything was right in order to achieve that. And I had to execute, because the 100 meters and the 200 meters are totally different events, even though they seem the same, but they're totally different. And the long jump is different altogether. So what did I do? How did I figure out a way to make sure those events are different? Well. I had different shoes for each event. The 100 meters was one pair of shoes, the 200 was one, and the long jump was a different one. So my focus became whatever shoes I wore, that's where I put my energy. And then believe in yourself no matter what. Because I always had a, I always had a theory that you're never going to win all the races. And people all the time say, gosh, we never saw you lose. I had a theory. You're going to lose races. We all know that. We've all lost competition. We've all lost races. But my theory was never lose on TV. Since people don't know that you ever lose. <laughs> So make sure when there's a television camera there, you're always ready to rock and roll, okay? So I might have been like 48%, but I was 98% on TV. <laughs> and, and then surround yourself with people that have the same type of motivation and attitude and focus. Whether they're at your level, whether they're better than you or not as, what, as, as good as you, just as long as they, they're motivated to be the best that they could be. So I had teammates. And so it went year after year where we just focused on these events. And then all of a sudden I came up to uh, 1983 and I competed at the Nationals and I won all three of those events. And I didn't go to the World Championships and I just I didn't do the 200. So the year started off, can he compete in all four of these events? And it was amazing because of the, the year started where I had a great season, indoor season, and then all of a sudden people said, well, that's a possibility. So it's funny how the question switched for can you do it to – what do you think will happen if you only get three? Think about this, people. Stay with me now. People were asking me, would you be disappointed if you only won three gold medals? And, and I was just trying to figure out, I mean, how do we go from, I mean, winning, going to the Olympics is a great thing, and all of a sudden we're saying you'll be disappointed with three gold medals. I, I didn't get that. But that's where, that's where it was, and that's where I was able to raise the expectation because of just mapping out this plan and focusing on winning the, the competitions and not, not getting wrapped up into every little meet or that great payday, but just really sticking to that plan and sticking and staying focused. So I, I go to the Olympic year and I get to the Olympic trials and it was the first time when I realized after the trials I won all three events that I could actually do this thing. So when you go to the Olympics, it's a whole different thing. And I remember walking into the stadium for the first event and of course it was 9 o'clock in the morning and the stadium was full. And there were 90,000 people there. And one of the athletes, who was a, was a gold medalist, I believe, in 76, Hazy Crawford, was in, in my first round heat. And he says, wow, look at this. It looks great here. And I said, oh, yeah, we do this all the time. You know, 90,000 people are always watching track meets. So I went through the competitions. And, of course, I went through the first one and the second one and the third one and the fourth one. But the, but the thing that people don't realize is that during those competitions, I – competed over a period of eight days and I had one off day. So after the first day, I won the 100 meters. The race ended at seven. Of course, you have drug testing and interviews and everything. So I didn't get home until about 11 o'clock. And I stayed in a, in, a, in a home with my, my parents stayed there, my family. And 
I remember getting back there and my mother said, well, dinner's on the table because we, we had a home and we had everything was set up and we had someone there to cook. Okay, so we get in there and this, this woman comes in ready to cook our food and everything. My mother's like, what is she doing here? I said, well, she's going to cook and clean and everything. And she said, excuse me, I did it all the way. She can clean this house, but I'm cooking this food. All right. So I have dinner and I set my metal down and go to sleep because I had a 10 o'clock in the morning competition in long jump and we have to be up four hours early. So I go to bed at 11. I have to be up at six. Now think about this. I just won the Olympic gold medal in the 100 meters and I, could, I didn't have one second to really celebrate about it. I had to focus on the next event. The minute that race was over, I was already thinking about tomorrow. And so the next morning you're up at six, you compete again and it went on for an entire week of staying focused and that was one of the four most important components of staying focused. It wasn't about you could, I couldn't celebrate until the last day because one little slip up, you're in the Olympics. You can make that mistake. You could lose the race. So I stayed focused all the way through here. And of course, I went on to win the last all four of those gold medals. And I remember of the four events, there was all a unique situation to them. Uh, the first one was the 100 meters. When I finished the 100 meters, I came up the steps and I went to Coach Telez. And he went over to me, he said, congratulations, and he went up and he hugged me. And he's right in my ears, he was hugging me, he said, if you had really focused and come out of the blocks like you were supposed to, you would, you would have set the road record today. And I was like, oh, that's interesting, I just won the gold medal. And, he, and here again, it was back to staying focused. And then he said, congratulations, good job. But it was that little subtle thing of like, keep your mind focused on the event. That's what he was really telling me in his own subtle way. The long jump, he said, I want you to, to go out and take one or two jumps, that's it, and rest for the next event. After you get two of it, I want you to jump well in the first event, first jump, get it over with. So we did that. So he said, okay, you did that well. The 200 meters, he said, control the turn. Make sure you control the turn, be in the lead, because they'll be worried. So every single thing was, it was, it was thought out and planned out. And, and, and I had to do it that way. And then the relay was great because America was the best team. And the only thing I had to do was take the baton and not drop the stick. Could you imagine having three medals and I get the stick and we're 10 yards ahead and dropping it? Um, so being a champion is so many different, so many different elements. It's staying focused. It's hard working. It's having good teammates, people that are around you that can help you succeed. Also, people telling you the truth when you're not doing what you're supposed to do. Those are all elements that are so, so important. And I, I just think that without that environment and without my coaching, there's no way I would, it would have happened for me. And I, I feel very fortunate about that. And so when I go out all the time, I, I talk to kids and I talk to people and I remind them of something and I'll close with this. I remind them, I, I say this one thing. I say, if life was easy, everybody would be good at it. It isn't supposed to be. So take on the challenge of being the best you can be because that's how you become successful. Take on the challenge of being the best you can be. And the last thing, make sure you always look good on TV. <laughs> Thank you, Carl, for that. I was uh, trying to figure out listening very intently to what Richard and Carl had to say and, and uh, what has it actually come down to if you could put your finger on it and say what makes these athletes so great and what makes them a world champion. Can you put your finger on it? I mean that's the key question. You know, So many people come close but don't quite make it to the very top and uh, these guys have. Focus obviously seems to be the prime motivator of this prime mover here to be able to get to where you need to get to. Obviously starting with the desire first, going through with the determination, the dedication to go with it and uh, to have a good team as Carl pointed out. Um, let me ask them the first question and I'll obviously throw it open to the house. Um, Carl, first of all, from our standpoint, our standpoint in India, is it fair to say that uh, we should be focusing on certain sports that we think we might be good at. Is it should we participate in across the board in all sports? As I said earlier, we tend to participate in everything. 
Um, should we concentrate and stay focused on a couple of sports that we think we can win medals in, or is it wise to go across the board? You no, know, personally, I think you have enough people. <laughs> that, I, I, I think you could do all those sports. My personal opinion is that you really need people that set the tone. Um, once you play tennis and you set the tone, then all of a sudden people wanted to play tennis. If we didn't have people out there playing cricket that they admired, then we wouldn't be great in that in that sport. And there, it is impo I refuse to believe that there is not someone that could be a world class sprinter somewhere in amongst a billion people, um, or a great marathoner, or a great long jumper. Although well, we do have a female long jumper, um, I, I refuse to believe that 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 just can't happen. So I think that it, you could definitely be a, um, across the board. Where I think um, India would need is the people that come in with the credibility. So let's say my coach, Coach Telez, um, after when I went in, he'd already had Olympic people that, that were successful. After '84, he proved to me I set world records and everything that he knew what he was talking about. So I didn't, I didn't question. Um, I always questioned what what the meaning of it was, or why did you ask me to do that, or whatever, so I would learn it. But I didn't question his knowledge. So um, he has the credibility. I think that's what is lacking in a lot in a country like India and a lot of people. Um, and that comes from whether it's from within or international. If there is someone that was maybe the national champion in India that ran, let's say, 10.29 seconds, that tells a kid, well, I want you to sprint this way. Um, and then someone like myself or Coach Telez, who I've run 9.86, and I come in and say, well, you, you know want to run it this way. There's, there's a difference. Or even for myself, if I talk to some, one of some of the great champions in anything, um, then I respect their word. So I think that what, what needs to happen, there needs to be more of an in, international influence uh, of people that come into town and teach and establish a credibility and understand that there is talent here and let them believe it. Because I, to give you an example very quickly, 30 or 40 years ago, Africa was not that successful in athletics. Well, a couple of them came to college in the United States, created opportunity. They had good coaching. They had good environment. Then all of a sudden, two or three of them started to become success, successful at that level. Then they started to place internationally. Then all of these African kids that were way out somewhere had access to a television, and they saw their people winning, and it was their, their name. They looked like them. They acted like them. Then they wanted to run. So all of a sudden, they believed that they could run. And now you cannot have an international competition from the 800 meters up without Africa dominating, not just being involved, but dominating. Um, so that's what is needed here. If there was an athlete that set the tone, and maybe they need to go out and seek out uh, another, another area to get the knowledge or to get the training, to get the success, so they come back and little girls say, oh, I want to be like that person, like Bobby George or someone else. I think that's what, that's what we need. We need to, to in, infuse some international influence to get motivation here. International coaching. Exactly. Talented coaches. So Richard, to come to a, a, a sport like cricket where you excel so brilliantly as an all-rounder, would you, would you say that uh, the focus is different uh, as a team sport as opposed to an individual sport? Well, I'm on record as saying that cricket is a team sport, but it's also one of the greatest individual sports within a team because clearly 11 people are going to take the field of play, but in cricket it's a one-on-one -on -one battle between the bowler on one side and the batsman on the other side. So it's skill against skill. And when you talk about the all-rounder, who's quite an influential person within the team because he's multi-skilled, uh, you've got to do two facets, and that is bowl and also bat. It's probably the hardest role to play simply because you've got to upskill yourself to the highest level in both sets of skills, whereas a specialist batsman will concentrate just on batting, a specialist bowler will concentrate just on his bowling skills. But when you've got to put together a package, it's very time-consuming, and I think it takes a special person to be able to handle uh, the role, for one thing, and the pressure of that particular job. So cricket is a bit different than uh, many other sports, in my view. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, questions from the house for Carl or for Sir Richard? Yeah. Right behind you. Right behind you. 
Hi, my name is Naveen Gupta. Uh, both of you mentioned that uh, the two key ingredients for success in sports are focus and mental strength. Now, do you think uh, these are hereditary traits, inborn traits, or can they be developed? Number two, if you feel they can be developed, how did you develop them in you themselves? I think uh, you learn by your mist uh, mistakes. And when you come into international sport, you want to be successful. And I remember as a youngster, I was 20, 21 when I first started, and I thought, here I am playing international cricket, playing for my country. Hey, this is great. I've made it. And then all of a sudden, you start having some pretty average performances. And then you think, well, why am I not competing? Why am I not doing as well as other people? And then you start sort of thinking, well, maybe I've taken some shortcuts here. Maybe I haven't worked hard enough. Maybe, um, you know, I've got to work more on my fitness, work more on my training, diet. Maybe I've got to be mentally better. Now, for me, you can have all the skills, all the talents, all the abilities. But unless you've got something here in the head which complements uh, those things, then you're only going to be half a person. And um, to me, it's a whole package, and you've got to put it all together. And um, I felt over a period of time I got better at that. Uh, I think when you're a youngster and, and an amateur sports person, you tend to be very inconsistent and erratic in your performances. Um, we're not talking about professionalism. We're not talking about money. I'm talking about preparation and attitude and doing the right thing, the sacrifices that you've got to make, the repetition, upskilling, uh, team player, all those sorts of things. Uh, put the whole package together. You miss one of those elements and you're going to be lesser a, a, of a performer. Yeah. Have a microphone here, please. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, um, from what I heard, it seemed almost like preparation for war. What both of you discussed about the way, you know, everything had to be just right. The focus had to be always there. There was not a minute to lose. You had to look behind your shoulders, etc., etc. I was just wondering, what was the role of serendipity and luck in your success? Because surely there were many, well, at least a few others were almost as good as you. That's the first part of the question. Why are you looking at me when you said that? All three of you. <laughs> it's to all three of you. And the second part of the question is, you know, you were great, you did all this, we really respect you. What keeps you as champions today? Because clearly you're still champions. What keeps you going as champions today? So two-part question. Well, I'll, t I'll tell you, the war thing, I'm a little sensitive about that now. Um, but, no, I, I think that the thing is, is that it's, and it, and it adds to what Sir Richard was saying, it's what that comes, what comes from that is confidence. When you have a confidence, then you're a, you're a different athlete. And the confidence comes from preparation and hard work and, and being ready. And luck is made in a lot of cases. I mean, because you have to be ready for it to happen. So I, one of the things that um, Sir Richard said in, in his speech that I totally agree. I knew what my competition did. I understood what the competition. So if I went into a, a race and we had rounds, for instance, um, I knew what everyone ran. So if I went into round one and I knew the best person, the fastest person in that round could run 10.3, then I would go deliberately run 10.29 in that heat to make sure that I got rid of all of them. And then the next round, I would know what everyone ran. So I would make sure. So I always ran fast in the rounds because I wanted to. The objective was not only to give myself the confidence, but to make sure that when they went to bed at night, the night before the race, they were thinking about, I'm going to have to run my best ever or else I can't, don't, won't have a chance to win. So here I am in their head. So it, it really comes with preparation and confidence and then a lot of the luck happens because you're ready but you have to be ready for things to happen you have to be prepared you have to you have to train hard and be in a situation where when when the, if the weather's bad then you're ready and you understand that the wind is going to be blowing in your face and you've prepared for that and and instead of where everyone else only trained with the wind at their back but you train with the wind at your face sometimes so that, hey i understand what it is so i can make it happen and they think oh he's lucky because he got a good throw no because i prepared for the the, uh, the variable so that that's what it's about go ahead okay this question is for both carl as well as for sir hadley uh, 
you know, I can understand being very motivated to get to the world record and so on. But after you reach there and after you got to the 400th wicket, really what keeps you motivated to get the next world record and the next benchmark that you set for yourself? Well, maybe I can start with that one. Um, <laughs> You know, when I got the 400 test wickets to be the first uh, bowler to do that in the history of the game, for me it was a major milestone and, and one of great pride but also one of great relief. But it goes back before that. I mean, every ball I bowled was a potential wicket taker. In reality, that never happened. But over a period of time, you pick up your first wicket, then you're getting your 100th wicket, your 200th wicket, your 300th wicket. And I realised that when I got my 300th test wicket, Alan Border, LBW at the Basin Reserve, Wellington. <laughs> Just in a bag of bit wonderful delivery, umpire gave him out. Hey, 300 test wickets. But then I was one of six people in the history of the game that had got 300 test wickets. So I became one of an elite group or a special group of people. And then I thought to myself, well, hang on, there are five people ahead of me. You know, whether there be five wickets ahead, 20 wickets, 30, 40 wickets ahead. And I just kept knocking them off one by one. And I talked about Ian Botham on 373. I got to 373. I needed one more to get to 374. And then I became the number one bowler in the history of the game. So to me, those little goals became very important. They were very, very powerful for me. And uh, when you achieve a goal, it just doesn't happen in one giant step. And if I can relate that to arguably our greatest ever New Zealander, Sir Edmund Hillary, the first man to conquer Everest, he didn't get there in one giant step. He took a lot of little steps to get to the top. And you find that that is what goal setting is all about. Once you have achieved that particular goal, got to the top, you must look to find something else to keep you going. And in my case, well, I went on to 431. At 39 years of age, it was my time to bow out of the game. And I could look back and say, cricket has been a wonderful part of my life. Thank you for the opportunity. And I hope that, uh, you know, I've left um, something for people to, to enjoy. So that's how I operated um, my particular uh, skill and role. <laughs> and put it out there for nobody else to get. <laughs> you follow all that, Come. <laughs> Hi. Microphone, please. Oh, the answer. Um, for, <clears throat> real quickly, for me, actually, I totally agree with the same thing. But, but for me, I, ne I never focused on a world record, and it's probably why I never got the long jump record. But <laughs> I, I, I only focused on the performance. Um, and when I went into a meet or a competition, I, I focused on running the best possible race that I could run. And I, I wasn't sure what that time would be. I, I believe it or not, I didn't believe I could run 9.8 until the year I ran 9.86. So I just always thought that I could run faster, and I kept running faster, and that was it. So I, I, I don't think I ever really focused on setting a world record my entire career, just on running faster, and they, then they started coming. If I could just take that up a little bit further, a lot of young people in sport will think of the end result right. first. And the thing is, there's a process to get to that end result. And that is the training, the preparation, the repetition, the mental, the sacrifices, the traveling, the touring, the participation in all sorts of games and tournaments and those sorts of things. And uh, at the end of the day, end of the year, five, ten years down the track, you've probably got that goal. So uh, it's the process first, not the end result. Right. In other words, they only see, it on, see us on TV, but we work when we're off. <laughs> Absolutely. Go ahead. Hi, these questions for both the champions. How hard is it to now live for the past, like, 15, 20 years without doing what you are best at and what you love? You know, you don't get to run or play um, now, so what is it like now? 15, 20 years. What? <laughs> Sorry, so I might have got my mathematics wrong. 17 years for me, uh, Carl. <laughs> I, yeah, I was 10, 15 is cool, but, I, but for me, I, and, and it's funny, we talked about this earlier, I loved what I did, every moment of it, I felt like I gave 100% to it all the way through, but also, from the minute I started, I realized there, was, there would be a time when I wouldn't. We have to understand that we're going to retire at an age where you start, where most people are just hitting their stride. So I, I understood that the entire time. I had other ideas of things that I wanted to do the rest of my career. So 
for me, it was a very easy transition. I just uh, realized that I was ready to retire, and I made that decision, and I haven't wanted to look back, haven't wanted to race again. Um, and I found other things to take that same um, high and energy that I got. And so uh, whether it's through foundation or other work that I do, but, but I just channel it somewhere else. And so I, I think it's been very healthy for me, and I feel very fortunate about that. I suppose when I look at um, my career, when, when I eventually decided to retire, it was a three-phase retirement. It was over a period of time. In other words, finishing county cricket, professional cricket in England in 87 to allow me longevity in test cricket, in other words, to give me an extra few years, to play my last games in New Zealand and then go on my last tour to England in 1990 to finish uh, where I had my first tour, in effect. And it was one of great relief to have actually left the playing field and, and to wake up next morning pain-free, knowing that I didn't have to do it anymore. But one of the great beauties of the sport that I've been able to, um, to have loved and lived and, and played uh, for all my life is that when you can't do it anymore, or perhaps more importantly don't want to do it anymore, that you can change direction within the game, within the sport. And when I gave up playing, I was able to go into cricket commentary, to write about the game, to coach about the game. I've been involved with selection for the last seven years, where I look after the panel of New Zealand cricket selectors. And uh, perhaps more importantly today is to now manage our New Zealand A team. It's the next best players coming through. So to take them on tours to places like India, to Sri Lanka, to Australia, and to be with those young players to uh, help them progress and hopefully make the international team in a period of uh, time, hopefully a short period of time, that to me is the great thing that the sport has actually given me. Not so much when I was playing it, but what I can give back to it now. Uh Can India win the World Cup? Is that the question? <laughs> Along with uh, Sir Edmund Henry, there was another Indian who was the first man on Everest, called Tenzing Nog. Uh, Vijay, I want to know that India, when sport bodies are in the hands of politicians and bureaucrats, are we going to produce gold medalists and champions? Well, I think the easiest thing for me to do, since I'm not the person to answer the question, it's easy for me to pass the buck. <laughs> but but uh, uh, to address the question, we all know that it needs to be incredibly focused and very professional. And uh, what Carl and Richard have pointed out very clearly here is that incredible amount of uh, uh, teamwork that goes into making an individual great and how you can channel that focus and determination and all of the above to create your own luck. Now, Carl mentioned the issue of uh, you're creating your own luck. I believe that uh, I believe that you do need divine intervention to cross the hump at the very end. And uh, irrespective of how well you played, you're still not going to win unless you have a little bit of that divine intervention from above. And uh, but to answer your question, I think the important thing as far as the um, a performance is concerned of an athlete in the country, the important thing is to leave it in the hands of professionals. Um, if uh, my good friend uh, Nandan was not running an incredible company like uh, Infosys, it was someone else's hands, like you or me, we'd run it into the ground pretty quick. Um, we are very fortunate, at least we are very fortunate in India that he didn't compete in tennis when, when, when I was playing because I wouldn't have been the best here. So I think it's very, it's very important to have the kind of professional attitude that business, corporate executives bring to business as we should in sport. And we've got to treat it the same way. The uh, unfortunate part about sport is, which we feel very strongly in India, is the fact that there are no guarantees. You can work all you want. You know, often I've, I've told kids this, you know, we can, we can make you into good players. I'm not quite sure we can make you win. It comes to a certain extent from within. I mean, what these two athletes have delivered 
on their own is them being out there on their own. They do all their homework with coaches and trainers and dietitians and a variety of other uh, team mates. But at the end of the day, when Richard goes out to bowl, he's there by himself up against someone with a bat. And similarly, when Carl's running, it's the same thing. So you're there by yourself, and nobody, nobody on earth can then make you win. It's just you and what it comes from within. And uh, that's sort of the hardest part from, from an Indian standpoint, because we tend to, um, <laughs> I often say this, you know, when, uh, when someone asks me in England, why do Indians not have great athletes, is there a problem? And I said, yes, it's when the British left India, they left their attitude behind as well. <laughs> so I, it's easy for me to blame them which is the same reason they haven't had anyone win Wimbledon since 1935. So, uh, I, think, I think we do have to get very, very professional, and, we, and I do believe in the last 10 years or so we're getting there. If 10 years ago someone had said to me that we would, we would have a young girl in women's tennis in the top 50, or we'd have a young man driving in Formula One, or we have a young man playing on the PGA Tour in golf in the United States, or we have a young man who's a world champion in chess, you know, we all would have probably laughed. And, and that has come true in the last five years. Yes. Uh, question to Carl Lewis, please. Carl, uh, you came through the system with a bunch of really talented athletes. Just to remind you of your 4 and 200 team, there was Willie Galt, Emmett King, and Calvin Smith. Now, what was the difference between you and them? I mean, you were all part of the same system, You, all great athletes, all with great coaches, everything. What is the difference? Were you a better athlete, or was there something mental no, that separated you from them? That was, that was where it started. He's right. I was better looking. <laughs> I crossed the line first. No, I, I, I think that, that um, I, th th there are a number of things. I mean, I felt, I felt that I was a better coach because we had different coaches. Um, so I, I, I'm always going to say I thought my coach is the best because I, I can. But I, I always had, I, I guess at the end of the day, some of it's talent. Some of it is drive. I want it to be the best I could be. I mean, there was nothing staying in my way. And I, I, even, even the little things about um, the, the athlete's rights, I wouldn't allow that to stand in a way because I believed in that. So I, I was so driven and focused on, what, on being the best that I could be that I think that that really separated me from a lot of people, not everybody, but from a lot of people. And it wasn't just about in terms of just winning the competition, but... Um, changing rules because that was important to me. So it was. It went beyond just being a good athlete. It meant pride because I wanted to leave something in the sport. And I know we talked earlier about the finances, but there are a lot of things that when I came into the sport, even the housing was was uh, deplorable and that, that I refused to deal with. And we we changed that and we changed. They used to run rounds in every single competition. And I'm like, we're running two races three times a week. We, everyone's dead. So we said no heat. Changed it to, to an ABC series. So there are a lot of things. I, mean, I took so much pride at every level in the sport. And I was driven so hard. I think that was a difference in a lot of cases. Um, and, and, I, and another thing, too, is that I just wasn't afraid to try things. I think most people, and I know you can attest to this, I mean, a lot of people are just afraid to, to take a chance. I mean, to, to have the nerve to even try to, to compete in four events. And most people said don't do it, so most people would be afraid to even try it. They said you can't do it, so they stopped. So you have to have the nerve to try it as well. So I just wasn't afraid, and that, and that came from my childhood, upbringing, having the confidence and the family and the support that I could fall back on. So if I did lose that day or something happened or it wasn't a great competition, then it wasn't because I wasn't good enough. It's because it didn't happen that day. What did you do wrong? Work hard the next time. Make it better. Stay focused on what you're doing and not take it personal. One of the things, and I, and I can probably attest to the same thing, is I didn't, I didn't dislike my competitors because my thing was that they wanted to win too. It's just that I wanted to win more than they did. It, had, it was nothing personal. I mean, everyone said I hate my I didn't hate my competitors. I mean, there was no reason to. I had no issues with them. I just didn't. I mean, when we got on that track, whether they were my teammate that I trained every day or whether there was someone from around the world, I treated them exactly the same. But when we left, we hung out. So. I was really driven to be the best that I could be, and that, that was a big part of it. Yeah. Um, could I say this, that uh, Carl said something very interesting. He wanted a full-time job in athlete, athletics. Well, if um, I have two kids, one of them came and told me that, I would be pretty shocked. 
because um, I wouldn't know for a fact whether she would be able to earn her living full time. Um, I think our kids tend to fall between two stools. On the one hand, they have academics. On the other hand, they have athletics. Um, and in order to excel, I think you need to have focus like you've said. But because of this peculiar situation where you don't know which way to go, a lot of our talent is lost. Uh, could you answer that, please? Yeah, well, um, in the United States, we have a unique situation where you can mix the two. I mean, the university system is great, and I'm not sure how the system works here. But the fortunate thing about it, the better athlete I became, the, the, the better opportunity. Because when, by the time I was a senior in high school, ready to select a college, hundreds of colleges were calling me and begging to give me a free scholarship. So, in reality, um, education was important because my parents were teachers and that's just the way it was. I mean, we were going to be educated and going to college. So, it, it was, it, the athletics became an opportunity to advance that as well. So, I looked at them both as parallel situations. See, I don't see why, if someone wants to be a full-time athlete, they cannot be a student. Um, people do it every single day in the United States and you, you really don't have to make choices. And oftentimes, even people make choices in sports as kids and you don't even know what your sport is. So I, I think the thing to do is to encourage them to do everything, to try everything, because they'll figure out what they want to do. And, and, and at the end of the day, if someone has a dream, you can't step on someone's dream. And if, if they wanted to make that choice, then you have to say, well, look, there's also a sacrifice. Yes, if you want to go on and, and go that direction, that's wonderful, but um, get something that's going to help advance that. It isn't a thing where school or education is something to fall back on. It's something to advance it. Um, and I know college athletes in the United States that signed professional contracts with an X because they couldn't read. Well, that same person's broke and their lawyer's rich. So it just does the math. It's not about falling back on. But I think we should encourage to get to education and also advance in sports because you're not certain what, 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 where you're going to end up. Yes. Right behind you. Right, right behind you. I had to train him to get to get the mic faster. <laughs> well, this is for all three of you champions here. Yeah? Where did you learn? Where did you guys learn to speak like that? <laughs> uh, how much did you focus and concentrate, and how much did you practice today to outdo each other? No, no. <laughs> You're on. <laughs> well, you're very kind to say that. Thank you very much. But um, I think if you uh, do some television like all of us do now, and um, it's easy to be an armchair general sitting in the in the in the seat. But um, it, it's it's uh, it's great. I think you get a perspective, a completely different perspective of things, and to be able to appreciate what the guys are doing out on the field, and uh, if you're able to relate it to the audience or the viewer, I think um, you learn to. You learn to kind of uh, uh, take command of the situation to a great extent. But uh, uh, I think we have time for just maybe one more question here. Um, May I? Uh, okay, we've got three three people with their hands <laughs> up here. So, uh, okay, the gentleman in the back, please. Sorry. Just, uh, just, okay, I'll tell you what. Let's, let's finish with the three questions, okay? Yeah. Just the three of them. Okay. I have a very simple question. Yes. Yes. Addressed to Sir Richard Hadley. Yes. What is the score tonight? <laughs> well, I was, I was rather hoping that you'd have it up on the screen very, very soon. We're getting there. Uh, we're getting there. I think there's about we're a half going. hour to go before there's a, a potential change of innings. So, um, we're going to come on, India. <laughs> yeah, come on, India. <laughs> okay, we have one of you. Yeah, I guess, I guess my question is uh, also meant to be for, for all the three champions, but because I was a very average cricketer and didn't play tennis, I'm going to ask Mr. Lewis. Uh, basically, I think a lot of what we've heard from, from both you and Sir Richard have been a lot about what has come from within. So, in other words, uh, how did you think and how did you deal with the situation? How did you respond? How did you manage your mind? And a lot of the things. Maybe I translate that as, you know, getting into the zone and staying there is, is one of the terms that I've heard used. Um, what I'd like you to reflect on, and you've all traveled around the world, uh, and all three of you, uh, before and after being professional athletes, uh, how much do you see the opportunity, the technology, the coaching, uh, what is available to an individual to flower 
and how much the system encourages it, that. How much has that made a difference, do you believe, to your own lives as compared to, you know, what it is in other parts of the world? So can you reflect on the other side? In other words, what are the influences on you, the facilities available, uh, the support that you got, uh, you know, and whether to what extent that made the difference as compared to what came from within, which, of course, we appreciate very strong. Uh, yeah, okay, I'll deal with that uh, quickly. I think early on uh, in my day, certainly parent support was huge uh, and the odd coach. But we played as amateurs way back in the 1970s and you had to do it yourself. Whereas today, if you look at a cricket team, you look at a rugby team, generally other sporting teams, you've got a coach, you've got a manager, assistant manager, you've got a mental skills trainer, you've got a, uh, a fitness trainer, you've got a physiotherapist, you've got a media relations person. In other words, the support team, you've got 11 players in a, in a cricket team, the support team's probably just as many, 11, in different strategic roles. And whilst they're all important and they've all got a key role to play to help a person perform, we didn't have those in our day. And, and basically we had to do it either individually to lift your performance or within the team that you had. And there is a danger today, in my view, that with all the support that is available, that the athlete, the cricketer, the athlete, is always looking around. Where's my physio? Where's my trainer? Where's my mental skills trainer? And there can be an over-reliance on all the uh, support network. And um, I think there's a fine line between using all that support and saying, well, hang on a minute, once I cross the field of play and I'm out there in the middle, hey, I've got to put my hand up and say, I've got to do it. No one else can help me when I've got to do it in that, in that split second. So, um, you know, fine line between getting too much information, which you can with technology, with computers and these sorts of things, giving you all the information that you need. Sometimes you can overload an athlete where it complicates them. And sport generally is pretty simple. Yeah. Stick to the basics. Why complicate it? Well, I, 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 I want to say something real quick. I totally agree with that because people used to ask me all the time, did you get on a treadmill and do all the physiological testing and all that kind of stuff and and I was like well what, what would I do that for they said oh to find out your lung capacity and your legs and your muscles and I said you know I knew when I got tired I knew when I was sore I, I got that part of it so I, I totally agree with you on that I think that people rely so much on that at the end of the day you have to just focus on competition and and probably in your career you're probably sore half of your career I mean, it's just the way it is. I mean, I, in 18 years, I was sore. My 16, uh, 15 years of it, one way or another. And you have to, you have to understand what's the difference in sore and injured, or how, how are you feeling good or bad, or what do you do right or wrong. That's that's something you have to figure out. And I agree with you 100%. I think athletes now rely so much on things as a crutch that they take away some of the focus on themselves. Last question. The last one. It's a, it's a privilege to hear the, cha the champions and uh, see that the sports used to be very different in your times. Now sports is money, basically. So now I wanted to know from you how much of the sports should look towards money and it should look towards business and towards sports because in cricket at least we know it's no more game. It's, it's more of money and betting and so on. So we wanted to have your reflection where the sport should go from here, whether it should look for money or it should look for the joy of playing and winning the game. Thank you. Quick comment from Richard first, maybe. To me, uh, the money is the end result of performance. I, I get the feeling with young sports people, and I only relate to what I see in our country, that the 18, 19, 20-year-olds see career paths in cricket, in rugby union, and rugby league, which are our main sports. And it's almost as though when they burst onto the scene that the sport actually owes them something. That's their attitude, that sport owes them something. Where, in my view, it's the other way around. They will always owe the sport or the game because the game gives you the opportunity. And it's as though with these young people, young sports people, when they burst onto the scene, they want the cars, the contracts, the endorsements, the fees, all the extras that, before they've even earned it. And to me, if you put in a performance over a period of time, the rewards actually take care of themselves. So somehow I think a lot of young sports people have got it all back to front with their attitude and approach to sport. Go through the process, then get the end result.
correct? Well, do not feel like it's alone in New Zealand. It's happening in the United States as well. The exact same thing. And I actually call it the P word because nowadays a lot of people, it's based on potential, not performance. And in reality, sports is about performance. It's who performs the best as becomes a champion. But fortunately, there are athletes that separate themselves from that, and they're the ones that become the great champions. But unfortunately, that's happening in the United States. But I see a change because I see the athletes, a lot of the athletes that are a little bit older or people getting in there are understanding it, and they're starting to get a backlash against each other because they're taking down their sport. They're, because in reality, the future is going to be both. It's going to be the purity of performance because I don't know many athletes that are great athletes that are thinking about, oh, that check's coming today when they're hitting that ball or running that race or, or chasing it down. And then, of course, the money as well. So. What I totally agree is that it has to be, if, if you take care of one, just like I heard 30 years ago, then everything else happens. But you have to focus on the competition. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, as we, I'd like, to, I'd like to close this session by, uh, first of all, on behalf of uh, Sir Richard, Carl, and myself, a big thank you to Arun and entire India Today staff for having us here this evening. It's been a very special privilege to be a part of this conclave. Thank you to India today. The final thought on what uh, Sir Richard and Carl have pointed out very clearly, and that is to be, to be the best that you can possibly be in whatever we do. And uh, that thought was best reflected by the very first African-American Supreme Court Justice in the U.S. who was when asked how he felt and what how he needs to be remembered, he said, quote, he did what he could with what he had. I'll leave you with that thought. Good night. <laughs>